Also, after years of hard work, production began October 2nd, 2020. It was really strange to fly when pretty much the entire world was shut down. Closed for business. And nobody was on the flights. In LA in the morning, there's the observatory. It was still exciting that production was beginning. Because the pandemic hit, the whole world is shut down. We're forced to have to fly to locations all around North America to film and capture these interviews. Later in COVID, I get a call, hey, can you come do a shot? And I'm like, sure. So the first round of interviews, which we created an entire cut of the film based off of, happened over nine days. We shot in LA, Atlanta, Cincinnati, Houston, and then back to Winnipeg. Our first day, first interview was Dr. Mary Neal, who wrote the book, To Heaven and Back. This has been several years in the making for our directors, Stephen and Chris. Getting into some deep interviews. <laughs> we wanted to create some visual separation between the experts and the people who've actually had an near-death experience. So we purposely chose locations that look like there could be their home. I could see this bloated purple body and I never felt alive and then dead. Okay, after a round of interviews with Mary, we spent a little time with her in the pool in the back. The heater was broken, so we had to hop into the cold pool. We wanted to get some underwater shots, putting the camera inside a fish tank and just submerging the tank a little bit. Yeah. Day two. So we're here on day two of production. Today we're interviewing Dean Braxton. We're going to go through some of the medical transcripts and documentation. As the interviewer is asking questions, we're just outlining if we have something that we want to chat with, we just kind of can communicate with Steve. It's a good process, we think. Even though um, it's, it was a uh, few years ago, I'm still read. I can, I live it, I talk about it as though I'm going through it at that moment because it's it's inside of me, you know. Super That's excited awesome. to be here, man. We're here. Paul Vieta, he had what you would call a distressing near-death experience. I think it's going to be a really powerful story. It wasn't a hallucination. They, they were real. It wanted me to die. Um, and it kept driving me to go that direction. We're on day three of uh, production here on our documentary, and uh, we're going to be interviewing Captain Dale Black. Going through his story today, we're actually going to go to the monument where the whole crash happened, and Dale will walk us through where the plane was. How's the uh, flight in and everything? I was a little disappointed on the final approach, but it's okay. <laughs> After this life review occurred, uh, something else that I have seldom shared, but something was happening in the room next to ours. Now you look out at the world and it's it's all reversed. It's it's just the opposite of the way people conduct themselves throughout the day. We're here at the portal of folded wings in Burbank, California. Dale, we just did the interview with him. This is where his aircraft actually struck at the top of that monument there. It'll be a really interesting moment. At the uh, place where Dale crashed his plane. I think they were gonna try to land in the in the cemetery itself. They pitched the nose up too high and you'd get an unsmooth airflow over the wings. It's called a stall. Nobody that knew is... I was in an airplane crash. Oh my oh. God, <laughs> only me. Travel day. We're heading out to uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Once the road five to six feet away, that's when you'll be able to stand up. It's rainy here out in uh, Georgia. It's the first time being here. Today we're interviewing uh, Dr. Sabum and Dr. Long, two near-death experience researchers. They've researched different accounts, some of the medical views of NDEs. Dr. Sabum has done some original research that he had done on near-death experiences in some of his patients. So we we'll kind of pull from the academic uh, part of the part of the film. We want to keep all the academic interviews looking like they're coming from a university. So we actually found this beautiful location, Oglethorpe University in Atlanta. It was perfect for Dr. Sabum and Dr. Long's interview. This is the very beginning of the pandemic. So we're working with doctors, so we had to keep safe distance. For Dr. Sabum's case, we actually had to do remote operation of the camera 15 feet away. Well, is that really a barrier or not? Must described in deathbed visions. Again, further strong evidence. On our way to Cincinnati, good boys. Welcome you here to Cincinnati. 
Today we're in uh, the northern part of Kentucky, uh, close to Cincinnati. It's a, a packed day for sure. We're on day five of production and we're going to be uh, interviewing Howard Storm. Howard's going to be in here, we're going to be uh, doing the interview. Howard Storm is, was a university art professor. Later we're going to be going to the Cincinnati Art Museum. My point in making a movie is to get people to think about their lives. Think that their actions have no consequences. And this was what people referred to as heaven. We're at the Cincinnati Art Museum. So we've hopped over into Ohio. We're just going to do some B-roll inside. We're going to be having Howard uh, walking through the art museum here, kind of reflecting. Everybody's working so hard. So we just have the crew over here just kind of setting up. If that they have pursued that to the best of their ability, they're going to God. And when they do that, they are going to know the Christ and they're going to know God. Boom and then we're gonna end up at his church. So we did another location move at the end of the day for Howard's interview. It was a long day, but we captured some reflection moments in the church, as well as had him walk us through some of the medical transcripts and some drawings that he made of his near-death experience. And we're on our last leg, second last day of filming. It's our pleasure to welcome you to Houston for the local time is 3.34. This is the last leg of interviews and we're interviewing Don and Eva Hyper as well as John Burke. The trick was having to make this small space feel like three completely different places. And so I wore this thing for about uh, eight, nine months. By third grade, they know how to sit in a chair, get in a line, and they get their foot. So our family was just disjointed. And I would go in and he would just lay there. He wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't acknowledge me. Just seeing how it's all come together. No, I don't accept any one story just at face value. I was anxious to get home. This is the real copy. Uh, it was wet because the pages were distributed all over the bridge for the police to pick up and put in order. And there is the blood that uh, came from me before it all flew out of the car. Six thirty right now. So we're at the Trinity Bridge here. Uh, this is where Don Piper uh, had his car wreck. Don will probably be able to. He'll probably just come right. Up. When we see semi trucks coming down the actual highway that's next to this bridge here, it's pretty surreal to hear like the aggressiveness. It's so tight in this space, and so if there was a semi coming down here, it, it would be really, really terrifying. Dawn, uh, he's going to walk us through where the car was. Anita Honorecker is going to be here as well. She was one of the first people that came onto the scene, as well as the state trooper who did the accident report and all that. So they're going to be kind of meeting for the first time together on the bridge and discussing all the events that happened that day. Yeah. Great to see you. Me too. Really anywhere else but here, but I'm glad to see you here. We just kind of let this moment roll. It was pretty surreal to hear Dawn and Anita, who was eyewitness to after the crash, Sven, who had done, you know, the police report. Ultimately, it didn't make it into the film, but we wanted to include it behind the scenes here just so you get a sense of, you know, what took place that morning. There's not too many opportunities to be in a place uh, where everything changed. Right. It was different after that. Yeah. And uh, here we are. Mm -hmm. If anyone had ever seen this highway and that incline over there, oh my goodness. Steep incline. That steep. Nope, you know, the truck was coming down that. I could not see it. It wouldn't have mattered, you know. I had no place to go. I uh, don't know, as badly as you were yeah. mangled up. This is such a dangerous bridge anyway, because there's nowhere for anybody to go. I've it's always, always heard been that. that way. Yeah. That there were a lot of accidents on this bridge. I worked Walker County. Okay. And that's why I said I wasn't even supposed to be here. I wasn't supposed to be the one to work the wreck. I was actually called to ask to just come and assist them on the accident. Exactly. But when I got here, I found out there was no other highway patrol here. And when I called over to Lufkin, which handles this area, they said, we're not, we don't have anybody coming. Oh. So that's when I found out, oh, I guess I'm working this road. Yep. That's back before we had cell phones. So right. every, all the communication was done through dispatchers. Exactly. And so I said, okay, well, I'll head that way. So I came up here thinking, okay, this gotta be almost over. I mean, the wreck's gotta be. Just but no, when I got here, I found out nothing had been done. Oh. Nobody was working anything, so. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, well, there were, you know, two other cars right here, and the, the truck had gone on down the bridge. Right. I remember the truck, the gray car, you, and Dick and I. Yeah. If I remember the accident right, what happened was 
the 18 wheeler came over, there was somebody in his lane. Right. He clips mm -hmm. that car, then comes over and hits you, then goes up and hits another, hits car, another car before he came to a stop. Oh my gosh, if this hadn't happened, I would have been in that wreck. Yes. Oh yeah. So that was so profound and it's so embedded in my sure memory. Was. And I just know I can almost walk to where the 18 wheeler was and then the gray car with an older man. Right. Then you were about right here. Right. And then Dick and I parked just right here. I walked past you and I went on to the older man in the gray car. Right. Did you and give him your up, coffee? I gave him my that coffee. Legendary coffee, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the only reason you got ahead of us exactly. that day. You know, that time of day and two lane road on, along the water. Rainy um, day. Yeah. Really yeah. Kind of a miserable day, Cold actually. And... It was terrible. Uh, I, the only memory I have is being finally elevated out of the car and put on a gurney out here and looking up at the girders with the rain falling yeah. on my face. Oh. And then I knew something really bad had happened and it was me. The first thing I remember of the accident was coming up and the, the ambulance was parked on this side. I come around the ambulance and they're about ready to load you into the ambulance. Right. You were on the gurney. Right. And they, you had those legs on there that they had to adjust. Well, they had a, they were having a hard time. I guess maybe they were in a hurry. They did it kind of rough. Ooh. And I remember seeing the piece of your bone fall out of your leg. And that's one of those things I never, you know, it you just never forget. You don't forget uh, that. The things that you must see that I would be, uh, you can't, you can't unsee that. Well, I mean, it was obviously a really bad wreck. Uh, when I came up, like I said, they were about ready to put you in. And... I asked them, is there other people hurt? They said mainly minor injuries. And then I, I said, well, what, what do you think about him? What kind of shape is he? And back then you went to a lot more measurements and things like that in a fatality. And the ambulance had told me they didn't think you were going to make it. So basically it was worked up like a fatality accident. When you see things like that, it's just something that sticks with you the rest of your life. I mean, you just don't, you know, you don't forget that. That's one of the things I don't hardly ever tell my wife anything when I come home from work. I just never have. Right. But that was one of the ones that I told her about because it was just, it was, you know, bothering me that much. So we drove to the top of that hill. Watch yourself. <laughs> and that's where Dick called your church from that payphone. I, I didn't know he called. When you became conscious, you told him your name and the name of your church. Did I really? And so he was the first call to your church. I'm only here because a lot of people prayed. Dick was so specific. Yes, he was. In the two things that he felt he had to pray. Right. He waited and he couldn't get past that urgency and that being compelled to pray. Yes. That the man live. We didn't know who you were at the point. Exactly. That the man live and he have no internal injuries. And that is as astounding as the fact that you lived. I think it is. The doctors just aren't sure what's gonna happen, but they're so confused because he doesn't have internal injuries. Right. Dick said, oh, I have word that he will live. Yes. <laughs> and I had prayed. That sounds just like Dick. Yeah, and I had prayed that he have no intern. I mean, that's amazing if you it's think astounding. about it. Interviewed Sven, the state trooper. We also interview Anita on a record in this same location. Everything is just so specific. Um, just gave me a new passion to live more intentionally. It's the end of phase one. Our way home. Back to Winnipeg. Well, trip's over. We're in Minneapolis. Got some caribou coffee. And now we're going to assemble an edit based off of all these interviews.